This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor with Colonel Jeff McCausen, United States Army retired author Jeff McCausen of the book Battle Tested, Gettysburg Leadership Lessons for the 21st Century Leaders. We come to the payoff, the third day of the battle. Lee orders an assault on the center of the Union line. And Jeff, is it still in Lee's mind on that third day with all of the losses? I think some units were 50 percent down. All of the losses that he can still overwhelm the Union Army and win the war here. Is he thinking that on the third day? Well, it certainly seems to be the case, John, that what he thinks. And he, I think he thinks this is also one of our last opportunities. And what I find fascinating, though, is best we can piece together uh, what he says and does with the subordinates. He keeps that, though, to himself. And it seems to me he might have inspired Longstreet in particular, who's the key, uh, key corps commander for this faithful attack, if he had simply said, you know, Pete, <laughs> this is, I think, our last opportunity for a major success, and we've got to take an enormous amount of of risk in that regard. And I use that to talk about the difference between risk and gamble. And those are different things. If you go, if you're going to gamble, you'll go to Las Vegas and you'll throw ivory or you'll play with cards. Uh, risk is a matter of calculation the possible great loss, but possible great success that all organizations have to make. And you're not going to risk the very existence of your organization over something that's trivial, but you might risk a large portion of the, of the existence of your organization over something that was truly decisive for its very purpose. And clearly, getting independence, winning the war, was what Robert E. Lee thought was the case, and therefore he's going to take this enormous risk. Secondly, I think what's quite different is how they have structured themselves. The Union Army has begun to organize uh, an intelligence analysis cell at the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac to analyze their opponents. So by the third day, the guy who's heading that up can actually describe to George Meade pretty much the full laydown of the Confederate Army, based, pieced together by deserters and other information that they've managed to gain. Robert E. Lee has nothing like that. So while George Meade is making decisions based on data analysis, you could say, Robert E. Lee is still going with his gut. It's kind of intuitive. The Yankees were strong on the north on day one. They were strong on the south on day two. We had successes. They weren't decisive. So the weak point on the battlefield must be the center. And that's why he determines that's where he's going to throw the last fresh forces he has, which in this case is primarily a Pickett's division of Virginians. Winfield Scott Hancock is commanding the center. And uh, the night before, Meade has identified the center as where the attack's going to be. Did that inspire the defenders to, to think that their commander had, had seen ahead, had understood Lee's tactics? Yeah, I think so. And the other thing, of course, that Meade has done is along with talking to his commanders and getting their opinion on what we should do, he also took the time to talk to them about what's the status of your troops, how's your ammunition, how's morale, and all those kind of things and do some reallocation. And it always surprised me that Robert E. Lee doesn't at least have that kind of a council that night to redistribute forces. Consequently, as Lee is riding down <clears throat> that early in the morning on the second day to give Longstreet his instructions for the attack, there are some, some historical reports that suggest that he's somewhat surprised about the number of wounded that he sees. And, and he even talks about, well, there'll be about 15,000 troops in this particular attack. Well, when you actually calculate them up based on the casualties, as you suggested, John, it's probably more like about 12,500. So it's somewhat curious whether or not Lee had a full understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of his own organization. And this brings up another fascinating leadership point to me, and that is there are some suggestions that Lee is not exactly in the best health. Uh, we know he has a bad back. We know he has dysentery. There have been some suggestions that he has a mild heart attack. He will die of heart disease about five years after the war is over. So he's perhaps not in the best physical condition while still being uh, forced to make very, very uh, important decisions for an organization, a lesson any leader should take into consideration. Pickett's charge, so-called, is an advance on the center of the Union line in the face of an enormous amount of long-range cannon. It's still difficult to read, Jeff. Yeah, about two out of every three people who begin that particular attack will be dead, wounded, missing, or never heard of again. The whole attack, of course, begins about 1 o'clock with an artillery barrage of over 100 guns on the Confederate side. That will go on for two hours. And then about 3 o'clock, 
uh, they will they will step off as they move across the 1.1 miles that separate Seminary Ridge from Cemetery Ridge and the angle and the wall, as you suggest, John. It's you know it's almost brutal to think about this, but as they're advancing, there are reports in diaries of officers and NCOs on the Confederate side who are behind their truce, which was where they were supposed to be to keep them online, and the things they're saying to the men. What are they saying? Well, they're saying things like. Homeboys, home. Home is just over that hill. If we can crack the Union lines and win today, you get to go home, back to that idea of winning the war. And also I think it shows for those troops the cohesion of the organization. And I often talk when I'm I'm there on the battlefield, talking about the strong bonds between people that get to do things that we don't believe possible. In my own experience being in combat, I'm firmly convinced that men in battle – uh, really, you know, the the, the flag and, and the, the Star Spangled Banner and all those things are very important to you and probably gets you into uniform or gets you to the field. But what gets you to from one side of the field to the other side of the field is the cohesion, the bonds right. you have with your fellow soldiers. They're going to go. They're not going to let you down. You're not going to let them down. And even today I was talking to a group of educators, and we discussed the fact that throughout this pandemic, they found a number of people that they were working with, teachers, staff, et cetera, who had planned to retire, pulled their retirement papers during the pandemic because they were not going to let their teammates down. That kind of cohesion is essential to any organization. We have a couple of minutes, Jeff. It's November 19th, 1863, a short speech by the president of the United States at Gettysburg. How does that help? Well, it helps enormously because I think what Lincoln does is take the opportunity in that speech to cast a new vision for the organization. He realized that the timing for that was then. And, you know, John, he wasn't even the principal speaker that day. That was a guy named Edward Everett who had spoken for two hours before Lincoln. Lincoln had only been asked about 10 days before then to give his speech, uh, which was 272 words. That particular speech is organized. You can break it into three parts that any leader can use. What are those parts? Where have we been four score and seven years ago? Where are we right now? We were met on the battlefield of this great war. Where are we going? We're going to a new birth of freedom. And up until that point, of course, the, the mission, the purpose of the war, what the organization of the United States was all about in this conflict was preserving the Union. Lincoln had said that in his first inaugural. In many ways, even the Emancipation Proclamation is really about preserving the Union, because it talks about freeing slaves only in the states under rebellion. doesn't do you any good if you're a slave in Kentucky and Missouri, Maryland, for example. But with this speech now, when Lincoln says, you know, a new birth of freedom at the very end, what he's basically saying, in essence, I believe, is now the mission has been expanded, still preserving the Union, but freeing the slaves is inextricably linked to that. And in 1864, he will run on that particular platform, much to the chagrin, by the way, of many major a Republican politician to argue with the president, that's a loser of an issue. Do not run on that. We'll lose. Lincoln insists he must do so because by this point, a substantial number of African-American former slaves have fought, died, and bled for the Union. The book is battle-tested. Jeff McCausland, the author. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Bash. You're listening to CBS Eye on the World with John Batchelor. 